when one you hear the meanest man on death row, one might think the person is still on death row. In this case James Dimbouchette is no longer on death row, but was considered the meanest man on death row. While he was on death row in Texas, James Dimbouchette was born on May 20, 1955, in Bexar County, Texas. As a child, he was known to set fires and kill stray dogs and cats. He failed elementary school multiple times due to his deviant behavior, for such he served time at a state school for juvenile delinquencies. He also served time for negligent homicide as a juvenile and for larceny and burglary as an adult. On October 17, 1976, James Dimbouchette and his younger brother, 18-year-old Christopher Dimbouchette, entered a Pizza Hut restaurant in Houston, where Jeff Hambrick was working as the restaurant manager along with 19-year-old Scott Sorrell working as assistant manager, and Scott's roommate 22-year-old Robert Chuck White. Hambrick told the two to leave because it was close to closing time. However, instead of leaving, James pulled out a 380 caliber revolver and started shooting. During the shooting, both Sorrell and White were shot dead while Hambrick was shot in the head, but was alive and pretended to play dead. Both brothers then ransacked the back office and left the restaurant with stolen change. The Dimouchette brothers were arrested not long after, and Hambrick identified and testified against the brothers. Omitting the formal parts, the indictment charged that James Dimouchette did while in the course of committing and attempting to commit robbery, intentionally caused the death of Scott K. Sorrell, hereafter styled the complainant, by shooting the complainant with a gun. James Dimbouchette challenges the sufficiency of the evidence to prove that he committed the aggravating offense of robbery, either acting alone or as a party. The evidence showed that James Dimbouchette's sister had worked at a pizza hut, at 5426 and 1 in Houston. Sometime in early October of 1976 she had ceased working there. At about 11.45 p.m. on the evening of October 17th, the manager of the pizza hut, Jeffrey Hambrick, was preparing to close for the night when a person named Harper entered and ordered a pizza. Hambrick took the order and Harper sat down in the booth closest to the entrance. Shortly before midnight Chris Dimbouchette, James Dimbouchette's brother, entered the pizza hut and asked Harper is the manager here? Hambrick came to the counter. Dimouchette ordered a beer and sat at a table nearby. A few minutes later James Dimouchette walked in and stood silently at the counter near the cash register. Harper noticed that James Dimouchette did not order anything, but that James Dimouchette remained standing near the counter by the door. It also became apparent to Harper that James Dimouchette knew Chris Dimouchette who was still seated at a table drinking beer. Harper found the circumstances strange and felt an urge to leave. When Hambrick brought out his pizza, Harper paid and left the restaurant a few minutes after midnight. At about this time Scott Sorrell and Chuck White entered. Sorrell was an assistant manager for Pizza Hut. Hambrick had agreed to show him how to keep books that evening. After Sorrell and White arrived, Hambrick locked all the exterior doors. Sorrell recognized one of the Dimbouchettes and invited the two brothers to join the other three men for a beer. James Dimbouchette sat at a booth with White. Chris Dimbouchette sat at a table with Sorrell and Hambrick. After about five minutes of conversation, Hambrick heard White say, 
I'd think twice before I pulled that trigger. Hambrick turned and saw James Dimuchet holding a large caliber revolver in White's face. Hambrick saw James Dimuchet fire one shot directly into White's head. James Dimuchet aimed the weapon at Hambrick. Hambrick saw White slump face down on the table and heard a second shot. The bullet struck Hambrick in the right side of his head near the ear. The impact knocked Hambrick back against the edge of a booth, from which he recoiled forward onto the table. Still conscious, Hambrick lay motionless. He then heard a third shot and a sound he took to be Sorrel falling backwards. Hambrick testified that he heard them run in the back room of the pizza hut, and it sounded like they were tearing the place apart. You could hear things falling off the walls and things being thrown around and you could tell they were ransacking the place. During this period, Hambrick also heard a gurgling sound coming from Soil. Hambrick then heard the two men return to the dining room, and heard Appellant say, Get the keys. At about that point, there was another shot, and the gurgling noise from Sorrel stopped. Hambrick felt one man grab him beneath his arms and raise him up slightly, while the second man searched his pockets until he found Hambrick's keys. Hambrick heard the keys jangling at the front door, and then heard James Dimuchet say, Out the back door, Chris. Hambrick heard the two run to the back, heard the deadbolt click, and nothing more. Hambrick remained motionless for several minutes. He then got to his feet, locked the back door, and called the police. Two Houston police officers arrived at the scene, while Hambrick was still talking to the dispatcher. The investigation showed that the cash register drawer was open and empty. A small amount of money was scattered on the floor. In the restaurant office, Things had been pulled from the shelves, drawers had been opened, and papers were strewn about the room. It was discovered that stereo equipment had been taken from the office. Hambrick testified that as the manager of the Pizza Hut and the only employee on duty at the time of the offense, he had care, custody and control of the cash in the register and the stereo equipment in the office. James Dimbouchet contends, essentially, that because the state failed to prove a completed theft the evidence is insufficient to show that James Dimbouchet committed murder, in the course of committing robbery. The sum total of all the state's evidence shows, at best, that James Dimbouchet was a party to the theft of some keys. It was never asked whether or not the keys were recovered. An equally believable scenario, however, based on the state's witnesses, was that with all the doors locked from the inside, the keys had to be obtained, not to appropriate them, but to use them temporarily to escape the premises. There is a distinct possibility that Mr. Hambrick, while not being aware that he was unconscious, for a time, was in fact unconscious and that someone else came in and took the stereo that was discovered missing. The state's evidence with regard to the money in the cash register was so self-contradictory as to mean nothing. The only sure thing was that by the time police arrived, the cash drawer was empty. At the outset it should be noted that proof of a completed theft is not required. The trial court charged the jury that, in the course of means conduct that occurs in an attempt to commit, during the commission, or in immediate flight after the attempt or commission of the offense alleged. In applying the law to the facts, the court charged the jury, therefore, if you find from the evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that James Dimuchet did then and there unlawfully, while in the course of committing or attempting to commit the robbery of Jeffrey Hambrick, 
intentionally caused the death of Scott K. Sorrell by shooting the complainant with a gun, then you will find the James Dimbushet guilty of capital murder. In his tenth ground of error, James Dimbushet contends the trial court erred in refusing to give either one of two special requested instructions. The trial court instructed the jury, in pertinent part, a person commits a robbery if, in the course of committing theft, as defined herein after, and with intent to obtain or maintain control of the property, he intentionally causes bodily injury to an individual, or intentionally threatens or places an individual in fear of imminent bodily injury or death. James was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death in 1977, while his brother Christopher was spared execution and instead given a life sentence. Christopher died on August 20, 2018, at the age of 60. In 1981, James' sentence was overturned by the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals arguing that de Mouchette had not been told his right to remain silent prior to his clemency exam. In the new trial, he was again sentenced to death in April 1983. In August 1983, de Mouchette fatally stabbed fellow inmate Johnny E. Swift a total of 16 times with a homemade knife, while inside a prison day room. For this, de Mouchette was given an additional life sentence, with his death sentences upheld. Months later, he beat and stabbed two other inmates, both of whom survived. de Mouchette also started setting fires in his cell, destroying TVs and at one point raped a cellmate. Following this, media attention surrounding the case began to increase and de Mouchette was nicknamed the meanest man on death row. On January 6, 1988, de Mouchette attacked corrections officers Charles A. G., 26, Scott Stoughton, 24, and Roger Barkin, 22, with a homemade knife after they attempted to search his cell for weapons. None of the officers were seriously injured, but Aji sustained three puncture wounds to the right thigh. With his execution fast approaching, de Mouchette's lawyers attempted to get the Supreme Court to review the case, but they ultimately did not decide to step in. On September 22, 1992, de Mouchette was executed by lethal injection, becoming the tenth inmate executed in Texas in 1992. He offered no last words. In total, he spent 15 years on death row. He is buried at Captain Joe Bird Cemetery. Mr. de Mouchette became the 52 Texas inmate and the 182 inmate in the nation to be executed since 1976, when the Supreme Court allowed states to resume the use of the death penalty. Thank you for watching Death Row.